Bering Straits region of Alaska, which consists of 20 Alaska Native tribes and 16 communities, is home to the village of Koyuk, our home. Our community, Koyuk, is located at the mouth of the Koyuk River at the northeastern end of Norton Bay, just 90 air miles northeast of Nome. Today, approximately 330 people live in Koyuk, of which 90% are Alaska Native. Like many rural communities in Alaska, the village of Koyuk is challenged by crucial social issues. We, the youth, are most affected by these. But as we listen and understand the wisdom and the stories from our elders, they will teach us how we can bridge together the delicate balance that exists between the old and the new. Our language is one of the Inupiaq language dialects, which is spoken by many of our community members. I am proud of where we come from, home of some of the toughest people on this planet, not only surviving, but thriving in harsh Arctic climates. These are our stories. 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 My name is Ethel Adams, and my na Eskimo name is Ayuk. I was born 19 September 14, 1932, and I was born in Koyuk, and in, I'm still living in Koyuk. My name is Roger Nasuk Sr. In the bed is on scene. I tell you, Umirak, which means growing grass. I was born December 22, 1929. Yeah, right over there. <laughs> no, my name, uh, given name is Melvin Oten, uh, Melvin Richard Oten. My Eskimo names, Sukayak and Amak Sharanak. I was born in Koyuk, 1950, May 24, coming up soon. My English name is uh, Esther, middle name is Rose, and my maiden name was Nagarak. When I married in 46, I became Kimuktok. My real mom's name was Maggie. Maggie and Paul Nagarak. Suluk and uh, my mom's name was Akuak. My name is Georgian Anasagak. My Inupak name is Ayachak. I was born in Shaktulik in 1944. My name is Kenneth Dewey Sr. I was born December 10, 1930, and what else? Eskimo name. In my Eskimo name, my Eskimo name is Sukayak. I have a big family, lots of great grandchildren. I'm a happy man. Our language was once forbidden, but never lost. I want to and will speak my Inupiaq language. My first teacher, I think it was Mrs. Clem. When we were first went to school, we got scolding. All of us didn't know how to talk English that time. She scolded us, she let us watch the blackboard stand in the corner for a half hour. And we talked to <laughs> Just school children. They didn't know any English words at the time. And even when I was starting school, I was still speaking my own language. And uh, they tried to stop this, our language talking in school, so they tell our parents, too, not to let us speak in our own language. That's why we teach our children when they grow up that we never speak Inupak to our own language to them. We just speak somewhat English we know. <laughs> we had a lot of old people here living in Koyuk, man and wife, when I was growing up. There's a handful now, maybe 
five or six of us now that could speak our language yet after that our children and other people's children they don't know how to speak their language because even my parents were that way too they only way they talked to their children was by talking English to them and never speak Inupak or your Yupik language. My dad's first name was Dewey. And now uh, them teachers didn't know how to spell our last name. They give us last name Dewey. There's a few of them with their last name like Charles, Adams, Ad Henry and so on. Only about two families got Eskimo names. I do remember I was fluent in the Inupak language prior to going to school. And once I entered school, it was discouraged. And interestingly enough, my parents who spoke only broken English spoke English at home for the sake of those of us that were still in school to, to try to keep our English skills up. And as a result, I, I don't speak Inupak all that much, but I do speak it up here. When it comes out, it comes out kind of goofy. <laughs> but I'm learning, I'm learning. It's slowly coming back to me. I understand it, I understand several dialects, but I just don't speak it very well. And that's one of the tragedies of the school system today is the loss of the Inupak language. A pistol and now on my chin, but you would allow me to call to the gypsy. Yan, if she need while I'm living, if she need wanted to know something, just don't be afraid to ask. Yan. For a thousand years, residents of Koyuk have maintained a subsistence way of life hunting, gathering, fishing. The wilderness is our supermarket, and it's always open year-round. If I eat potato chips, I'll be hungry in two hours. Eskimo food is the best. The very first berries in season are the salmon berries. They are the first berries that are ready to pick. Mom and Dad used to have us pick them while they're still hard with caps. And we'd bring them to camp where we'd uncap them and my mom would cook them, like, like you do dried fruit, delicious. And that was our very first fruit of the season, cooked salmon berries. Following the salmon berries, the blueberries. After the blueberries, the blackberries, then the cranberries. Love to pick berries and I can walk forever. I'll find a big berry patch, but my problem is I'll find bigger, better berries over there mm -hmm. and leave the berries behind and walk to find bigger, better berries, which never seem to happen, but I still think they are. When my bucket is full, I'll go back to the boat only to find the zillions of berries I passed. I can't wait to go pick berries. Green. Springtime, pretty soon they're going to grow again. When the ground is uh, getting soft right now, no more snow, we go, we'll go. look for mussel, get some in. And we, they always be real sweet, the mussel, real good. Wash them up and eat them. We pick everything. We get leaves from the wheels. We call them sura. Before the leaves get the uh, bones, they let them dry. We put them in seal all day, never spoil. 
They're good, you know, just like when you want to eat vegetables, you know, these. Here we add onions, two, three different kinds, put them in there. It's good when you dry fish. You know, seal oil to Eskimos is like olive oil to Italians. You use it on everything. My mom, grandparents, you know, they put away food in uh, pokes. They yeah, had no plastic buckets. When they seal hunt, they, they skin that eyes. They start from the mouth all the way back, and when they're done, they turn them around, take the oil off. And hair inside, the skin outside, after it dry. And they cut them a little more, they fill it with seal oil. You can put berries in there with seal oil and leaves. Oil meat, oak meat, when that, even there raw, that seal oil cook them in there. And there's a real good little smell. Even the seal hunters, winter time here in the early spring, they go camp to hunt seals, put tent even on top of the ice. They were kind of tough people. <laughs> they, they mainly hunt to survive. Um, we go out seal hunting, I go with them. We go sit down out there next to the open water. I sit down, they put their kayaks on the side, ready to shove in, and then they sit there all day long waiting for seals to come up. And the, and the seal would come up far away, far away out and then they would scratch that ice. And the seal would look up and leave us, what's going on up there. So he dived down. And he wait. He wait right there. The seal would come up a little closer. And then that guy would start scratching. Huh. And I better get a little run. He dived down and uh, yeah, so when he get close enough to shoot, they get him right there, you know. Either spear him or shoot him. That's how they, that's how patient them hunters were. And I get lots of whales. My grandpa teach me how to get up early with a tide. When, when tide coming, them whales are easy. Go get them. I get lots of whales in my life. They mainly hunt to survive survive. They hunt every day to get fresh food, what's available for the season. Ptarmigan and rabbits, winter time, and moose didn't come that early. Moose came kind of late. Yeah, my husband used to trap all the time. Lynx, wolverine, and everything. And I used to be with him all the time. Go with him, go camp even winter time. Go camping. I used to follow him wherever he go. He want me to go follow him. So I know all the places around here, all over. We go all over, even with boat way up Coyote River. If you want to visit my community, you can't just drive in on a highway. The only way you're getting in is by plane, boat, snowmobile, or the old standard dog team. Travel is difficult even in modern times, so it's hard to imagine how it was years ago. The main men used to travel only dock teams, no other rides like snow machines or no airplanes hauling people around. <laughs> yeah, that was a good, good life I grew up in. We first went out dog team. We longest I was out 18 days caribou hunting. Nothing to eat. The quickest time I was out with dog team was nine days. We get sled load six caribou on sled load. Like him, they go hunt caribou. They can go out in the morning, and come back same day. They travel fast. Life really changed, and 
since my childhood, when I was born in 1930, I fell through the ice across here. That was just before I got married in 1953. In the fall time, we were uh, hauling stuff to cross there to go look for a uh, jet train, a pilot that disappeared over there. After I bring a load across to that point, I was coming back, and then my leader wanted to turn out the other way. I keep saying, ha, ha, and I started chasing him. So now he was trying to go around the thin, thin ice, and that was my mistake. And then the whole team went through that uh, thin ice with me. We just slept. And uh, the tow line, the dogs want to climb on me when I fell through, through, you know. And pretty soon I couldn't pull my arm out. I had only one arm left because it was tangled up with the tow line. I went under three times, tried to come back up and then only one dog that saved my life was the leader that I tried to boss around, you know. That was my mistake. That dog was smarter than I am. Anyway, luckily there was a guy named Archie Henry close by with another team, you know. He hollered at me, hollered at me, tried to come up somehow. So I stick my hand up and then, then uh, I feel that rope, and I grab, grab a hold of it, you know, I squeeze my hand. And I, I squeeze it so hard, he kind of, I, I feel him when he pull it a little bit, you know, make sure I got it. And then uh, I was still down there, and he said, ah, hang on, I'm going to break this ice up to a secret place so I can pull you. I can hear him. I'm from the water, you know, talking up there. And then after, after he got me halfway out, he, we couldn't open my hands, they freeze. And my, that rope was only in the middle of my middle finger. Just, just to, just, uh, maybe that's why I squeezed it so hard. So he had to cut that rope on both sides. <laughs> yeah. And I I pass out. I don't know that. Next thing I wake up inside the house. Everything was free. Everything was just free the mainly and just have to pay for uh gas. Not it didn't cost that much when they start using motors. And later on, they start using snow machines in the early 70s, I think. And then they, people get rid of their dog teams. He'd, he'd go out um, in the country when the snow machines first came. And even if they broke down with no parts out in the country, he'd always find a way to make the, the, the snow machine work using whatever he found out in the country. He'd always make it home. I, I heard one story, a uh, person, when they first saw airplane pass by, and I don't think they were real fast. He looked at it till, till the top fall backwards. <laughs> Who's astonished to see a plane, I think. Then um, at 1938, that was my first plane ride over there from Isaac's Point. I was standing between the pilot and uh, old man Nessuk, 
hanging under their chair, you know, watching them guys, that pilot, was showing that old man, what's this for? And this is a throttle and this is a mixer, stuff like that. He was showing them to the old man. That's where I learned how to how the airplane fly. <laughs> That's my first airplane ride. We never complain about our living long ago. We live the way all the people lived. Anyway, we didn't have any bills to pay, house payment, electricity payment, fuel payment. Everything was just free. We used to just sail or paddle, you know. When the wind is right, we go sailing, or we go up the river, we let the dogs pull. Outboard motors start coming, you know. Four horse elder, the way you start them is like this. You know, no rope or no electric start. Sometimes I wish I was back in the day. No motors, no four wheelers, no nothing except dog team and your own two legs. Spirituality is all up to the individual. Some people are afraid to talk of these things, but I am glad when they do. It's part of our history and who we are. When I was growing up, I don't really think, but uh, uh, some of the elders, them I was with to each other, you know, when they have uh, nothing, uh, nothing else to do. They go visit and tell tales, sing their song long ago, because they used to have, a, there was a curry down there behind that A-frame house. He, this guy uh, was William Oten, his Eskimo name was Sukuyak. Uh, he would lay down on the floor, fold his jacket up, use him for pillow, Lay down and start singing, ayang, 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 But the words he say, they're too quiet, you know. And I would try to, I wonder what he's singing about, you know. So I asked him, what's he, what he's singing about? Well, well, before I go seal hunting, I just sing a little song. <laughs> he sing them uh, songs, you know. But uh, uh, at that time, uh, the drums were con because the preachers uh, came around and, you know, tell these uh, poor Inubaks that drum was wrong, you know. I think that Eskimo dancing is good, but we were, we, we start living like we don't know how to dance. They're good, all right. Fun to watch them. When the older people gather and tell stories, they used to talk about those uncles. How they were bad ones, I mean. Real bad ones. When they don't like somebody, they just can uh, go someplace to where he's living and just kill him somehow. Because of that, they tell the people not to uh, start dancing, and they, they were obedient, and they stopped dancing in this area. There were some good, good young folks that child, that's, that, uh, but they won't show off. That's the way them old folks tell us, you know, they, they won't show off because they, they would heal somebody, you know. But uh, this evil one would so often, you know, he can do this, he can do that. Can see, that's why it's because of that evil one that that drum singing uh, was uh, taken away. <laughs> yeah. Even in our past, 
uh, enough cooks. There was two types. There was those that did good and those that, you know, used what they had for um, mostly controlling people. And uh, it, it's something that um, a lot of people get a little, um, sometimes you get um, impassioned about it, how you feel about it. You mention enough cooks for somebody, they'll get all upset. Oh, you shouldn't talk about it. You shouldn't, uh, don't mention that, you know. It, it's something that will come back to you. It's not. It, it's uh, something that my parents taught us. I used to have the ability to see things a few years ago. One of my brothers was like that, and it's because there were shamans in our past, in my, in my family's past. Um, I would have visions during the day. Uh, my wife likes to tell this story about uh, one day, it was uh, February, around February, I had this vision of a wolf. I knew exactly where it was. I, I knew where it was. I, I knew it was a black wolf walking up the Kigludalik River. So I started putting on my winter gear and she asked me where I was going. I told her, oh, I'm just going out into the country. I'll be right back. Going out in this storm, I told her, it's not stormy out there, just in Koyuk. So I left. And I went uh, up over these hills into the Igludalik River. And there was a wolf right there where I saw it. I shot it, went back home. I was home in less than an hour. Um, I walked in the house and she asked me, you come back already? You know, she was surprised. Too bad of weather out there, you know, comments like that. They told her, no, I got what I went out for. Those things were something that, you know, my folks used to tell us were passed down generation to generation. And uh, because of my religious belief, um, I converted my life a few years ago and I lost that ability because it was taken away from me. And I don't miss it. My papa's uncle was a shaman. And that was the last shaman that my parents knew of. A shaman did good did not do evil, but helped other people. Helped with, sometimes the way they helped were supernatural, but they, they were helping other people. I always, often wonder, even before the missionaries came, there was a being they called Silam Inoa. And that was even before Christianity came in. Silam Ino, so our people knew good because they had Silam Ino, a person that overlooked the world and saw the world. This is a uh um, let me sing that song I learned from Oswald Moses. Don't mind me if I go out of tune. <laughs> I came a good man, all I can find. Making money in my club, I sell them to the wine. See it all in top card, catch the fire pool. A scoot coke, coke, for the Eskimo. Hurrah, hurrah, a summer super league. Hurrah, hurrah, a summer super league. I go. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>